Um, can El Paso be a place that leads the way in how you educate Latino students? What would that example look like and how could it be replicated? Our speakers today include Javier de la Torre, Superintendent of Isleta Independent School District. During his leadership, de la Torre has overseen safety and security updates, new athletics and fine arts facilities, technology upgrades, and the construction of several new campuses. Representing the University of Texas at El Paso today is Andrea Cortinas, Vice President and Chief of Staff. In her Chief of Staff role, Cortinas helps UTEP administrators in carrying out their responsibilities to the university. Angelica Haro manages the Education Services Center for Region 19, which serves El Paso area schools. ESC Region 19 provides professional development in such areas as technology, bilingual education, special education, gifted and talented education, curriculum development, teaching skills, administrative leadership, and programs for at-risk students. Eddie Rodriguez helped establish CREED, the Council on Regional Economic Expansion and Educational Development in 2014, and serves as its executive director. The organization is focused on increasing educational attainment in the El Paso region. And our panel is moderated by Bob Moore, who joined us during our first conversation of the day. Moore is founder and CEO of El Paso Matters. I turn the program over to Bob. Uh, uh, thank you uh, uh, very much, Matt. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, and I, I think in some ways it's fitting that this panel follows the economic development panel, that you'll see a lot of uh, commonalities here. Um, I, I want to start by saying that, that I've had the good fortune to uh, uh, lead reporting efforts on El Paso since 1986. And so uh, uh, one of the things that, that I'm hoping we can do here is to sort of talk a little bit about the journey that El Paso has, has been on um, uh, uh, really since the early 1990s to close some of these gaps that I talked about in the, the, the first panel uh, for those of you who are here for it. And I'd like to just uh, start with a, a couple of uh, uh, quick questions to, to the panel about this issue of what other communities can learn from El Paso. And I want to start uh, on the positive side, journalists are often uh, accused of being negative, sometimes with justification. But, but on the positive side, I'd like to ask each of our panelists uh, uh, to describe what's one good thing that El Paso has done in education that, uh, 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 that other communities can, can copy. I want to start with, with, with Dr. De La Torre. Uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, she's currently the superintendent uh, in the Isleta Independent School District. Uh, 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 but he's got wide experience in education really across the country, so I think he's well positioned to, to speak to this. So, Dr. Del Torre, what's one good idea that other people can steal from us? Yeah, great. There's a lot. But uh, the one that uh, struck me almost immediately, by way of background, I'm from California, and I spent uh, the first 22 years as an educator in California before coming to El Paso. And uh, for any number of reasons, some of the misconceptions that have been shared throughout the day were misconceptions that I I had uh, when I came to El Paso. Uh, the one thing I like to take, uh, tell our staff is, is that uh, we're a petri dish. We're a microcosm of what Texas, and some may argue the country, will look like in the, in the near future. And what we get to do is we get to be those individuals that work together to crack the code on what it takes to educate Latino students 80%, 90% typically in school districts in this region, uh, where one of three of them come to us, where lang uh, English is not the primary language at home, where 80% of them uh, are eligible for, qualify for free and reduced lunch. That means they have limited resources, they're socioeconomically disadvantaged. And what we have is we have an isolated region, the, this Petri dish that I like to describe where change and change management isn't as accelerated as it is in other parts of the country. What I mean is the students I have today look just like the students I had 10 years ago. And with the, with the culture, the climate uh, in El Paso, and it was uh, referred to recently, and that is that about 90% of our teachers uh, at one point were the students. They come 
from New Mexico State University, UTEP, Sol Ross. Uh, they're very familiar with the region and they're also very familiar with the DNA, the profile sitting in front of them. And they also have the added advantage of knowing what um, getting a good education and moving on to a post-secondary institution can do to the trajectory uh, in this student's family. So what we've been able to do as uh, a region is, if you look anywhere else, uh, and I, I ask you, I challenge you to look anywhere else, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, Austin, Fort Worth, there isn't a region anywhere else in the state where their Latinos perform as well as Latinos perform in El Paso. So in many regards, we're often um, approached by these school districts who see their Latino population increasing, who see the emerging bilingual or English learner population increasing, and who know that until they can reach and effectively support those students, it will reflect either positively or detrimentally on their particular school district. And so they're starting to recognize that we, we have elements that we've put in place. Uh, we're, we're big believers in wraparound services because we know they come from families who need more than just sending their kids to school. They need daycare, they need healthcare, they need nutritional uh, assistance. They need more than your typical or traditional or historic experience with their school district. So wraparound services is something that uh, many school districts um, offer the parent and the student. The second thing is we try to get them in the door as soon as possible. Many of us have pre-K programs for three-year-olds, four-year-olds, and then they go into kindergarten where they get a formal experience. And even though it's a little difficult because, you know, Latinos like to have their children with the grandparents, with the aunt, with family, even though they're not getting an education, they just feel more comfortable with, th with that concept. So we worked really hard to message the importance of, give me that three-year-old, it will benefit he or her in the long run. Uh, we're big on the, the science of literacy. We accelerate second language acquisition without losing their primary language. So we make them bilingual, reclassify them sooner. We offer advanced placement courses for them uh, because in many cases there isn't um, an achievement gap. In many cases, it's an expectations gap, right? And oftentimes people expect less from their Latino students. Um, algebra in the eighth grade is something that we want for all students. So we know all the triggers. And um, I just think that we've become sort of the model for any school district that works with a predominantly Latino population who are taught by a predominantly Latino workforce, which is something that I think we promote to these school districts when they go through selection processes and hire, please find more teachers, administrators, leaders that look like the majority of your students. It does go a long way because they've lived that life and they know the needs, that type of thing. So we have a lot of good ideas and a lot of good things that we do here. Uh, so just to uh, talk about some of the points that Dr. De La Torre focused on and some data and to expand on graduation plans. Um, and so a few years ago in 2013, uh, House Bill 5 introduced a foundation school program with different levels of graduation plans. Um, so you have 22 credits, which are minimum. Um, you have higher uh, plans that include an endorsement at 26 credits, and those particular graduation plans also include the student um, having to take Algebra 2. So our districts in El Paso do exceptionally well. They do better than the state average, at least 10 percentage points in their graduates obtaining the distinguished levels of graduation plans. Um, and this is extremely important because these plans include the student having taken Algebra 2. And if a student doesn't do that, they will more than likely not be able to pass those college entrance exams, which are very, very Algebra 2 heavy. And so El Paso is truly focusing on sending students out extremely prepared to be able to handle the rigor of post-secondary. 
Um, the another, uh, just really quickly, another area where El Paso really excels, this was alluded to in the, the previous panel, is that direct to college enrollment. So that direct to college enrollment is a metric that is uh, for accountability uh, for other legislative um, measures tied to funding like House Bill 3. And El Paso always does better than the state, certainly in the last few years. Um, so what El Paso did that was so significant is not only do we have the highest um, direct to college enrollment of the state at 54%, but El Paso very, very quickly got that percentage back to pre-COVID percentages. Um, South Texas is another region, as you know, that also does very well in educating Latinos. Uh, but certainly in these kind of metrics, El Paso does better. And El Paso does better than other regions in the state as well. Yes, um, you know, our involvement as, an, as a nonprofit is really engaged in making the connection between economic development. That's why Bob said it was kind of good setting that the prior panel preceded us and the need for elevating our educational attainment especially as we look at the different uh, competition that we've got as, as a region, not only within the state of Texas, but also around our particular areas, whether in New Mexico or in Arizona. Our emphasis is really trying to engage philanthropy to be able to further an objective that ele elevates the trajectory of, of uh, educational attainment. And as has already been spoken about, all of that to lead to the fact that the demands of the existing economy as we go into it require a post-secondary credential of some type, whether it's a full year, four year degree, or whether it's a two year associate's degree, or whether it's a certification. The one thing that we have learned through the data that we've evaluated is that a key, and there's no denying this, to the success of our population and the students that we educate is the quality of our teaching and the quality of our teachers. And one of the things that I think the rest of the state can emulate, if you will, is a program that we put in place working with the University of Texas at El Paso's College of Education and working with uh, El Paso Community Foundation as well as the Workforce Solutions Borderplex in pursuing what we call a teacher residency program for the teachers that are just graduating from the College of Ed. And as all of the educators here will tell you, um, you know, they, when you graduate from or you're getting ready to graduate from the College of Ed, you're going to spend a little bit of time trying to get your feet wet, trying to understand what it is you're going to take up as a teacher, try to get your feeling in that situation. Well, one of the things that we discovered is the fact that the amount of time is really not justified for the kind of getting that exposure. And so still, a lot of times, teachers come in having been exposed, whether it was for six weeks or maybe a month, or maybe sometimes less, depending if they took the approach on an online course, to be able to get a true sense of what really goes on in the classroom so that when they're hired by the school district, they actually can walk in from day one and be at least in a position where they can have the influence and the engagement that you expect you want to have with a professional in the classroom. So through this process, what we ended up doing was creating a stipend uh, supported process through the philanthropy initially with the ad objective that if this worked the way we thought it should work then the school districts would would uh, invest in this process because that's where they would get in part the recruitment of their teachers and so this is an entire year or two semester uh, process where the teacher gets engaged with a senior teacher with whatever district they happen to be working within and the stipend covers those two semesters and now going forward uh, the stipend is uh, still available with respect to certain districts that are not yet participating, but I'm glad to say that pretty much all of our districts are participating in this program now, and it's been expanded to effectively cover essentially the full uh, class that's graduating out of the College of Education, which originally we started with a little pilot group and to see effectively how that would take on. So I think that's one particular model that really was born in El Paso, if you will, with especially the component of the stipend, which I think really made a difference for purposes of making it work. 
And so I think that that's a good example for purposes of the rest of the state. And uh, Andrea, um, uh, the, uh, I have one good idea you'd share for the rest of the state. So I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to give you two things that go hand in hand. Everything that everyone has said really makes a lot of sense to me and resonates with what I'm going to say. The two things that I think we've done that go hand in hand are, number one, the creation of the El Paso Collaborative for Academic Excellence in 1992. We work together, like Superintendent De La Torre mentioned earlier. We're isolated, and as a result of that, we work really well together. UTEP, EPCC, Philanthropy, Region 19, all of the school districts. And together, we raise the ed educational aspirations of our region. As a result, from 1992 to 2020, we saw a 76% increase in the number of high school graduates in our region. That didn't happen by chance. That happened with dedicated work by all of the people in this community and many of the people that are in this room today. The second thing is a strong commitment for over 30 years at UTEP um, in access and excellence. Access to excellent education that has an impact in our community. Uh, prior to, to um, that mission, um, most institutions of higher ed believed that in order to be excellent, you had to be exclusive. They believed that they could measure their success by excluding the students that they deemed undesirable. UTEP does not believe that. And it's something that I'm very passionate about because I am a product of the collaborative. I graduated from Andrews High School in EPISD, enrolled at EPCC, transferred without any problems because the collaborative had put in place transfer mechanisms, so all of my credits transferred. I attended UTEP, obtained an excellent education, was able to compete and get into Berkeley Law School on a full ride and come back to serve my community. This collaborative works and the access and excellence mission at UTEP works by preparing UTEP students, El Paso students, to compete anywhere. Uh, so we're gonna talk some more about uh, all of those issues as we, we, we go forward. Um, uh, so now I wanna set the stage, uh, you know, go back three decades. Uh, Texas had a huge problem, uh, um, uh, many huge problems, but in, in, in education, uh, we had a problem with uh, Hispanic students lagging uh, uh, Anglo students on a number of performance measures. And as I said earlier this morning, it's not because uh, uh, Latino students are uh, any less capable of doing good work, we just uh, they, they largely weren't given the chance. And because El, El Paso at the time was 75 or 80 percent Latino and student population, that gap showed up here. But El Paso took a number of very deliberate steps, uh, as Texas also uh, took some steps to, to address this problem. And I want to talk uh, about them in a little bit more depth because you've already heard a couple of the, the concepts introduced. Uh, uh, Angie, talk some more about the collaborative that, that, that Andrea mentioned that really took steps to link K through 12 and higher ed together um, uh, to have sort of deliberate outcomes that we were trying to achieve as a community. Yes, yeah, so as Andrea was mentioning, the collaborative has been in place for over 25 years, um, and it is housed at UTEP. Uh, Ms. Yvette Savina, she is a VP uh, for uh, Student Transition and Access at UTEP, and she is the director. Um, my boss, Dr. Armando Aguirre, the executive director, he also is a member of the collaborative as well as a gentleman and people, or ladies and gentlemen here on the stage um, are also members. And it's really a very cohesive group uh, of civic uh, industry, of post-secondary, of K-12 members. And what happened a few years ago um, in precisely increasing all of these metrics in college attainment and graduation rates in just uh, general academic prepared, preparedness for students of the region is that uh, the board and also some designees from the board uh, got together and developed a regional scorecard um, that included metrics for just economic prosperity uh, driven by education and also that academic preparedness. And several, several measures were looked at uh, to include uh, measures that are uh, in the accountability system for K-12 K in Texas. Um, as well as, you know, how uh, many hours of dual credit, you know, are beneficial for students or have proven 
um, that will um, incentivize them to go on and continue into you know higher degrees. Um, so um, it is quite a a great group of very um, uh, well uh, people that really get along. Um, and that show up for this kind of work and that have the students' outcomes and students' best interests in mind. Uh, Dr. De La Torre, uh, uh, individual school districts uh, have experimented in El Paso with a number of, of, of different approaches. Uh, and again, a very um, uh, intentional and deliberate process uh, to try to change the way you organize the, the school day, uh, the way you structure uh, classrooms. I would, I would guess probably the thing that Isleta has had the most success with um, is changing approach to, to teaching algebra. And, and it's worth noting that as a result, and I hope to talk more about this, as a result of the changes that were implemented, students uh, are uh, in the, the, some of the poorest high schools in the Isleta school district are outperforming students in the wealthiest school districts in Texas on algebra uh, results. So, so talk about some of the deliberate choices that, that you've made over the years to enhance student performance for the uh, largely Latino population you're serving. The one thing I've learned, and I've been uh, with the Isleta Independent School District for 10 years. Look, here's my pin. I got it the other day. Um, and I've been in... Um, El Paso for almost 15 years. And there are, there's typically a little resistance when it comes to academic freedom. I can promise you there is very little academic freedom in the way we approach algebra. It's, it's very prescriptive, uh, but it's very effective. And as Mr. Moore said, Isleta High School is a regional leader in algebra. Del Valle High School, um, is also a regional leader. They outperform Eastwood High School, they outperform Montwood, they outperform schools that on the surface would appear to have, if you look at historical demographics, a huge advantage when it comes to uh, the hard sciences and, inc and that includes algebra. Uh, it does start with, as Mr. Rodriguez pointed out, uh, the, the credit goes to, to the faculty that is willing to as I said, adhere to a prescriptive model that starts in the fifth grade in preparation for eighth grade algebra and then ultimately those that attend um, the high school. What you'll see is you'll see a shift from that great performance at uh, Isleta High School and Del Valle High School at the high school level. You'll see that shift go to the middle school because what we're aggressively promoting is that those students that used to take it in the ninth grade now please take it in the eighth grade without seeing a decline in performance. And that's what we've been able to see. So we're very excited about what that looks like. When we as a district started and we uh, eliminated the eligibility element for pre-K, basically Pre-K used to be only available to those parents who qualified based on income. And we decided a long time ago, 10 years ago, that uh, pre-K was too important uh, to exclude any students. And so we made it both universal, available to any family in the district or outside of the district. Because one of the things you have to remember that is somewhat unique in El Paso, we are all open enrollment districts. We get up every day and we know we're competing most of the time in a very friendly, cordial way with neighboring school districts, with charter schools, parochial schools, private schools for families and students. The last time that the Isleta Independent School District saw any growth is the year that Mr. Moore came to El Paso, started working in El Paso. It was not my fault. I just want to make that clear. Once I heard that, I started wondering, wait a minute, is there a connection here? But 1986 was the last time that the Isleta Independent School District grew. And so we've been in a pattern of declining enrollment for over 30 years. And so we know and we appreciate, we embrace the fact that we compete every day. So customer service or what we refer to as service excellence is a big part of what we do. The thing that keeps us up at night is this, that the United States is the only country where going to school is almost as, is, it's, just not an economic element. There is such a strong social element to it, and you won't find that in most developed countries. 
By what I mean by that is if I move from one math textbook to another math textbook, no one is gonna to come to the board meeting. But if I decide that football is too expensive, right? Yeah, torches, things like that. And so one of the things that the American school system has assumed responsibility for is all this social cheer, football, sports, all of those things that in other countries, they, they're, they're really direct. They're kind of what creed's about. Schools are designed to support economic development, economic prosperity, and so that these students can contribute to society first economically before we worry about whether or not they're gonna play football, basketball, and, and, and those type of things. So if we're gonna compete at a global level, we've gotta put as much emphasis in the academic side of things as we do in the athletics, the fine arts, the clubs, the extracurricular, co-curriculars. So we're trying to really promote the idea that, that it should be academic first because they'll tell you, and by they I mean Creed and others like Creed, will tell you that yes, we do a great job of educating students, they perform well on the ADAF accountability system, we're an A-rated school district and a high percent of our students go into colleges and universities, a high percent of our students get uh, financial aid, one in five will see a baccalaureate degree within six years. So what happened to the other four students? And that's, that's the other code that we're trying to crack. How do we get them out of our school into the university and have them at least earn an Associate of Arts, Associate of Science degree or a baccalaureate degree in that five, six year period? Uh, Eddie, a good transition to you then. Um, let's talk about the, the role of philanthropy. And, and to be clear, what we're talking about here in El Paso is a group of business leaders that decided to pool some philanthropic resources uh, a few years ago to in invest in schools. And you talk a lot about uh, a concept of uh, more high quality seats in schools. So talk about um, the, the, the use of philanthropy uh, through Creed uh, and, and what you're trying to accomplish with that. To uh, just go to the next step after uh, the observations by Dr. De La Torre, the focus of our engagement is really to understand the economic growth that we're trying to accomplish as a region. And from our estimation, based on the evaluation of the data, the only way we're gonna get to where we wanna go is to improve our educational attainment levels. It's a, it's, it sounds simple, but it's not a simple thing to accomplish. It's, you heard Dr. De La Torre go through some of the things that from a school system standpoint, you have to contend with in trying to get to that destination. The other aspect is this, as you heard from the prior panel with regard to economic development, economic expansion, the skill level that we have in our population is directly connected to whether people believe they should come to this region, whether they want to expand into this region, whether they want to select us over a Dallas or a Houston or a San Antonio and feel like they're gaining quality by doing that. So workforce development is really critical and workforce development from our viewpoint means 80% of the student population. It's not the top 10%, it's that big group in the middle that effectively needs to figure out what they're going to do and are open generally to a lot of suggestions about the things they could consider because they don't walk in with any preconceived ideas necessarily as you might find in the other aspects of the demographic. But it is the recognition that even though it's already been pointed out a couple of times, El Paso has the highest percentage from a state standpoint of enrollees who graduate from high school and go into post-secondary education. It's around 55, 56%, where the state averages are between 52 and 53%. Our percentage of completion is not at those levels. It's far, far below. The Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board tracks eighth graders, follows them from when they complete eighth grade then the 11 years that presumably they'll go through high school and then any kind of post-secondary uh, training or, or credentialing. And in our case, 
The most recent assessment for the eighth grade cohort reflects that 22% of those eighth graders will get a post-secondary credential within that time frame. That means that 78% are not getting anything. And from the calculations that we've done from an economic projection standpoint, that means that we're leaving, they're leaving on the table $8 billion in potential earning capacity and living capability by not making that selection. So this is a critical component to how we can effectively not only continue to grow our economy, but to expand it and attract the level of compensation and capability as reflective of higher skilled workforce. There's a direct correlation between per capita income and the level of educational attainment. And it's a direct proportion. The higher your educational attainment, the higher your per capita income. So for all of our discussions about you know, minimum wage, living wage, competitive wage, it comes down to what you're bringing to the table economically and the educational system is critical to making that happen. In engaging the philanthropy, one of the things that uh, we looked at, which is reflective of the comments here made on the collaborative as it relates to dual credit hours, students that'll take anywhere from nine to 12 dual credit hours while they're in high school, double their chances of not only enrolling in post-secondary education, but actually completing. And so when we saw that particular data point, we thought, well, maybe one of the things that we should consider doing is expanding the number of dual credit teachers so that you can expand the number of dual credit classrooms. And from that came the idea of what we call the Accelerated Certification for Teachers Scholarship that Creed funded and has continued to fund, working with all the school districts, to effectively allow individual teachers who are seeking to get that credential, because they have to have the same credential that you would have in a college classroom, which usually means they have to get a master's or an advanced degree of some level, to cover their tuition and do it by paying them up front. We're taking the risk that they may not complete, but we don't think that that's going to happen. And that way, it encourages a larger segment of the teacher population to pursue that credential, because most of the districts do have a scholarship program that supports their teachers in that respect. But what we found is that most teachers weren't taking advantage of it, and a lot of it had to do with when they got paid for what their uh, engagement was about. So we felt like this is one way that we can improve that particular statistic. And just to give you a sense, when we looked at this six years ago, seven years ago, there were about 150, 160 teachers, a little bit under 200, that were considered dual credit certified. And this is out of 13,000 teachers in a, in a districts of nine, nine districts. So that's, you know, that's a disturbing trend. I can say that in the five years that we've had the program in place, that's effectively doubled, but that's still not enough for what we're trying to do when you think about that 80% of that student population that we're trying to engage and is necessary to engage to be able to accomplish the success that we want to be able to have. You've already heard some discussions about eighth grade algebra. That's a very significant acceleration point for purposes of the learning and the student attainment because the two subject matter that the students really do need to have mastery for if they're going to be able to succeed on a post-secondary basis includes algebra, advanced mathematics effectively, and uh, domination and capability to uh, analyze through the English language, as well as evaluate and make presentation in both written and oral forms. So those two subject matter more than anything else create the pathway for that success, and that's where we want to target our philanthropy. Uh, 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 Andrea, in your uh, initial comment, you mentioned uh, uh, UTEP's philosophy that uh, access and excellence are not ex mutually exclusive, and in fact, they work well together. So, so ex talk a little bit more about that, and especially how it connects with, with some of these other efforts we've been talking about, whether through the collaborative, um, uh, through uh, better teacher preparation. Talk about UTEP's role in all of that. Sure, so um, 
like, like I mentioned, uh, access, excellence, and impact is deeply weaved into everything that we do at UTEP. Uh, but we know that access isn't enough. We know that students have to obtain a meaningful postgraduate um, degree. And so to that, we've put a lot of effort into studying ourselves. And I'm really proud of the work that we're doing there. Um, Dr. Heather Smith at UTEP is a leader in this area. She has studied uh, the levels of risks of our students. Um, and in analyzing that with the whole group of people at UTEP has developed a research-based advising model. So we can de determine you know, we, everyone come in, everyone, we're gonna teach you how to swim, right? We're not gonna keep anyone from coming in, into the university. But once you're here, we're gonna assign you a, an advisor. So every advisor has no more than 350 students that are um, uh, assigned to that advisor. And then based on Heather Smith's research, they determine the level of risk of that student. Uh, many of our students, almost 50% of them, are, for, are the first in their families to go to college. They're first generation college students. So they don't have someone at home telling them how they can succeed. They don't have someone at home walking them to the school to apply for college or checking in on them with homework. Um, many of our students come from very low income families, uh, which many other universities do not face. So when you compare UTEP to other schools, it's not an apples to apples assessment. Our students are dealing with real life issues. They have to work, they have to help their families. Many of them are parents, like I was when I was at UTEP. Um, and so our advisors look at all of those things. They also look at how many hours they're working outside the classroom. And they've determined that if they're working more than 20 hours outside the classroom, the risk level goes up. So in addition to advising them on what classes to take, what semester to keep them on track. They're also looking at how they can reduce the risk. One of the ways to do that is to offer on-campus employment. Many of our students are employed on campus because they get meaningful work experience and they stay at the university where someone can offer that mentorship to them. The other thing that we're doing is that we um, offer uh, very low tuition. And any family that makes less than $80,000 a year in Texas qualifies for the pay dirt promise, which means that we cover all um, mandatory tuition and fees. Um, the other thing that we do that we're very well known for, and it's something that not, not many other universities do, we engage our undergraduates in meaningful research. Most other um, R1 universities, you can't get into a research lab if you're an undergrad. You just can't. Something that we're doing to help with the risk level of those students is getting them into research labs as undergrads. What that does is that increases the probability of them persisting. And I'm really happy to tell you that the persistence rates are improving semester after semester. So that's what we're focusing on because eventually it's going to reflect in the graduation rates. But we've got to do it from one semester to the next semester to the next semester. And for all of our students, the last persistence rate that we have is 85%. That is up there with highly selective universities, right? They, they have those rates, why? Because they only take the students that perform really well on their SATs, that have really high GPAs, that don't have um, commitments outside of school that are high achievers. UTEP students, yeah, we have some of those students, but we also have a lot of students that don't have that benefit, that are working their way through college. And I'm really happy to say that we're building that momentum and that persistence, persistence is improving year after year and we're continuing to do that. Um, uh, I want to let everybody uh, know that we'll take some questions from the audience momentarily. Uh, for those who are uh, joining us, if you could go uh, to, to the back corner where, where, where Matt uh, 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 is at right now. And uh, there's also opportunities to, to submit uh, some uh, questions uh, online. Um, uh, uh, before we get to the audience question, um, uh, Andrew, I want to go back to you. Uh, and uh, to start talking a little bit about some of the challenges that, that, that lie ahead. Um, uh, Dr. De La Torre mentioned Isleta's uh, challenge with declining enrollment uh, over uh, uh, the last uh, uh, three decades, or as he put it, since I got here. Um, uh, uh, 
But now we're seeing in El Paso that issue popping up everywhere. And, and we're also seeing it probably in most major metro areas in the state. But for UTEP, you have a long history of drawing the vast majority of your students from El Paso County. We're now in a situation where we have uh, fewer kids born every year than we're graduating from high school. So you can look out over the horizon and see uh, that, you know, as of today, our population of kids under 10 is 12% below where it was a decade ago. So obviously, just relying on kids from El Paso is not going to uh, be the solution going forward. So talk a little bit about what UTEP is trying to do um, uh, to draw uh, uh, students from outside of El Paso um, uh, to the university. Sure, so this is something that we look at every week in our cabinet meetings, right? It's really important for us. Um, we're doing several things. Number one, we're continuing our commitment to this region. That's not gonna change, that's who we are. Uh, we know that there are still a lot of students that are graduating from high schools in El Paso that are not attending um, EPCC, Texas Tech, UTEP. We want them to attend somewhere. Whether it's EPCC, UTEP, Southwest University, Texas Tech, what we care about is that they get into a, a college, whether it's for an associate's, a bachelor's, and beyond. Um, so we're doubling down our efforts, and I'm really happy to tell you that our enrollment for freshmen has increased. We've set record numbers over the last two years. So we're doubling down. We still think there's tremendous capacity in our region, and Actually, a lot of other universities are realizing that and they're coming to recruit our students. So we're having to work even harder to keep our students here and to demonstrate to them that we're not just a local university. We're a class uh, research, uh, R1, top of the line research university in their backyard. So number one, continue our emphasis and our focus on our region, our kids in this community. Number two, we believe that all students even those that are not fortunate enough to call El Paso home should have the opportunity to engage and to apply and attend a world-class university. So we are focusing on expanding our enrollment area. We're looking at other parts of Texas. Our marketing uh, team is working really closely with enrollment, uh, looking at Arizona and California. And we are seeing some increases in those areas, but not, not nearly as, as fast as we thought we would. Uh, and so we're continuing that effort and it's gonna, it's gonna keep happening. And then number three I've already talked about is persistence. So a, a really, um, a misconception about enrollment is the enrollment numbers are, you know, just the new students coming in. A third piece of it is that persistence. And so how do we keep students in college? Because once they, they drop off for a semester, it's really hard for them to come back. So how do we keep them engaged so that they stay with us semester after semester? So it's really three things that we're doing um, in that area to, to look at ahead and address the issue of the, the drop off in population. Uh, Matt, we've got some questions. Yeah, just a reminder for those joining us online that you can ask your questions at texastribune.org slash ask. Go ahead and submit your questions and we can ask them uh, for the panel. But we'll go ahead and, and have some questions asked from our in-person attendees. Uh, and I'd ask uh, if you'd identify yourself so we, uh, uh, we know, just your name is fine. Hi, uh, Melissa Lagunas. Um, so my question is, with the drive uh, of various educational entities dependent on funding, do you see any uh, actual or potential issues with those financial driving forces that may develop with the possibility of the issue of quantity versus quality um, in buying for those uh, much needed funds? Dr. De La Torre, I think you're probably uh, in as good a position to answer that question uh, uh, as anybody. So being in this led independent school district, um, and experiencing declining enrollment every year has positioned us uh, to simply have a budget development process that never ends. We know we're gonna get less money next year because we're gonna have less students, so every year it is our responsibility to reconcile the ledger. And we do that primarily uh, by relying on attrition, positive attrition, retirements, resignations, relocations, doing an analysis every month um, to make sure that the number of FTE or full-time equivalent positions in the district uh, reconciles with the number of students. So being able to project enrollment is really important. What a lot of people don't realize is that even if your enrollment goes down, but you can increase your average daily attendance, which is the driver behind the revenue, you can almost 
offset any loss that you may experience as a result of lowered enrollment by increasing our average daily attendance. And that's how we've been able to stay out of the newspaper relative to deficit spending and being in a position where we're talking about health and welfare benefits and reduction in force and things like that. But um, being very intentional, being very strategic with the resources you have and being able to accurately anticipate what those resources are gonna look like, not just a year out, but a three year period out has been really helpful to us. Um, I think that the detriment that you're seeing uh, in the area happened for two reasons. One, when ESSER funds, federal funds to support us during the pandemic and shortly thereafter landed, those funds are soft monies. That means they have a, a sunrise date and a sunset date. Uh, we made sure we did not hire long-term contract employees with short-term funding. Um, and so what you're, what you're seeing uh, across the country is what they call the fiscal cliff. And that is you hire all these people, you feel that it, this is, you know, obviously a rainy day, a pandemic, you got a, everybody on, bur on board, burn the ships, that type of thing. And so you go out and you hire all these teachers and all of a sudden the money is no longer available in the 24-25 school year. The second thing, and it primarily happened in Socorro was, Socorro had been one of the fastest growing school districts in the state uh, for probably the last two decades. And so they assumed we're gonna simply continue to grow, right? And that didn't happen. So it kind of gave them a, th a double thump. One, you hired people on money that you knew would no longer be available, but you thought because of the growth, you'd be able to absorb that. And then the growth didn't come. And I'm guessing that the growth slowed down because the mortgage rate went from 2% to almost 9%. And people sort of put the brakes on going out and buying homes off of East Lake, Pebble Hills. Socorro's growth also slowed because you do a very aggressive job of recruiting students from Socorro. Uh, I think I think it's worth pointing that, and it's competitive, right? Yeah. It is, it is. And you know, nothing, nothing promotes your district better than things like A ratings and Young Women's Leadership Academy and those type of things. Um, and we do have some trustees that think we should be able to reverse the decline in enrollment. And I think sometimes we get caught up in the numbers, you know, more students is better. And I always like to say, I, I don't worry about the kids I wish I had, I worry about the kids I have. And so being better doesn't necessarily make you a better school district or a more effective school district. So we try to focus on not who we wish was sitting in our classrooms in terms of numbers or demographics, but who is sitting in our classrooms in terms of demographics. So, so the, 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 the answer to the question so far is largely focused internally on what we can do here to manage. I yeah. think the thrust of the question, though, may have been more about state funding not keeping up with the, the demands. One of the other reasons some districts, not yours, are dealing with a deficit is they made a decision to uh, implement pay raises in the budget this year on the bet that the legislature would fund it. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, so what's the role of the state in funding um, uh, uh, needs in communities like El Paso? So what I ask you all to anticipate is this. I believe that the legislature, specifically the governor, has the votes he needs to secure school choice. And so you can anticipate that in January of 2025. I also believe that once that's secured, Doing that alone will show a huge disparity between what traditional um, public school districts get now and what a parent would get in the form of a check. And so politically, he's going to have to increase our basic allotment as well. By how much, we don't know. So what we're looking at right now is, I think, a one-year or at best a two-year problem before we see an increase to our finances that will allow us in the region to continue and do the great work we're doing uh, for students uh, in El Paso. Uh, Matt, another question? 
Hi. Um, thank you. My name is Dr. Sandy Garcia, and my background is in public health and demography, but I promise my question is on education. Um, first of all, let me thank all of you and the organizers at the Tribune for this fabulous session. I've just relocated back to my hometown of Kenya, too, in El Paso. Um, after being out for quite a while, and I'm coming from the Buffett Foundation in Omaha, where I was spearheading um, their research and evaluation unit. One of the most um, groundbreaking uh, evaluations that, that we, uh, that I, my, my unit funded, was a randomized controlled trial of um, a multi-cohort, it was a longitudinal design, multi-cohorts of graduating students at, um, coming out of Nebraska high schools in Omaha, actually throughout the state. And um, the randomized control trial was looking at those factors that were ultimately leading to graduation. It was looking at enrollment, retention, and graduation. The MIT side was very quantitative and very black and white. Our director of um, college access and success there, however, had the insight to also ask the question, could there be more beneath the surface of the numbers? And we contracted, my unit did, with um, so people. Just, we're we're uh, running out of time rapidly. Could you get to the question for the Yes, the panel? I'm getting there. Thanks. They are finding at USC that another one of the um, factors that is so important, especially for low income and uh, students of color, are some of the softer um, skills, such as having a sense of belonging and being able to feel supported um, at their institution of higher ed. So my question is, um, we haven't touched upon that here, what um, mechanisms are in place, um, say at UTEP or in the Community College Network or even in the K-12? Um, we are primarily Latino community. You talked about um, families wanting to have their children taken care of. I think there's a connection there with this importance of a sense of belonging, and no one has discussed it. I wanted to see if there was a Andrea, something. you want to tackle that one? Sure, briefly. Um, so we do a lot at UTEP to support our students. Um, the UTEP Edge is one of the programs that we have um, that really focuses on getting students um, not just the experiences, but also the connections to individuals on campus. I, I've got to give a huge shout out to our faculty. Our faculty, many of them are not from here, but they come here and they truly embrace what it means to serve our region. And so our faculty care about their students. And when you have that mechanism in place, first and foremost in the classroom, that uh, takes it to a whole different level. The other thing, research, which I've talked about, even though um, you know it's, um, it's not wraparound care, getting them into those research labs is really helpful. And then of course our amazing um, student affairs section at UTEP. They do have, like Dr. De La Torre mentioned, um, at, at his district, they have lots of different programs for students. So for example, uh, I mentioned earlier, many of our students come from very low income families. We have a food pantry that any student has access to. We have a career closet. Many students feel that they can't go to that interview because they don't have something to wear. We, we will provide them with that. We have counseling on campus. Uh, we actually are one of the largest counseling providers in the region and it's located on campus. So all of these things are, are there um, and they're there to support our students and they have a variety of other programs available to them through um, student, student um, affairs. Uh, Angie, talk a little bit about that leading up to UTEP too and, and what kind of services we, we provide to kind of smooth that transition from K to 12 to higher ed. Yes, to, so to supplement funding for the school districts, we've concentrated a lot, our efforts a lot on competitive grants. Um, so I, I, I did not dive into this at all when I started at Region 19, but I trained myself too in order to be able to fill out these competitive grant applications, which as many of you know, it's about making a good case. And we have been awarded uh, specifically in the CTE area, which is really great in order to be able to offer programs for students that are sometimes not available um, at school districts that may be uh, focusing on other programs of study. So we've done like architecture and construction for students. We've done IT CompTIA uh, camps also for students. And when we write these applications, we ensure that all 
all school districts are included because we do not want to just have, you know, 80% or even 50% of the districts be able to participate. Um, and we have a great turnout. Um, and we've tailored this to also do it during uh, intercession for students. We've also acquired grants for teacher preparation. Right now we have a huge grant. We were actually the state recipient at uh, Region 19 for bilingual education certification which we offer free of charge, certainly to the educators of El Paso, but also throughout the state. And the courses are online, so it's very, very, um, it, 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 we tailor to teachers' schedules in order to help them obtain their um, ESL and their bilingual uh, supplemental, again, free of charge, because we acquired the grant for the state in El Paso. Well, uh, I think we're at the end of our time. Uh, I don't want uh, Matt to come up here and give us the hook. So uh, uh, please join me in a round of applause for our wonderful panel today. Th thank you so much for a very invigorating conversation.